So good evening, dear colleagues, and welcome to the IIRS webinar on pterygium. Pterygium was first described by Shushata way back in 1000 BC. That's long back. And if we talk of a surgical approach for pterygium, it was a simple excision, leaving the sclera bare there. The recurrence rates was very, very high, almost 30 to 80%. The cosmosis was very poor. And this has been abandoned by most of us. Since then, various modifications of the technique have been reported. And with current approach, the recurrent rate of surgery has come down up to zero even. So today we have got with us some of the best new surgeons sharing their expertise on latest technique on the terium surgery. Just have to share my screen. Are my slides visible? Yes, sir. So today's theme is Terrigium. Will I learn something new? Because a lot have been told about this. Or I am wasting my time. Let us, the audience, be judged for that. And with us, we have some of the best faculty. With us are Dr. Arun C. Gulani, one of the best known earlier surgeon, other effective surgeon. And he had a lot of, lot of things. And he's internationally recognized for his terrigium work. Dr. Gurani was a former chief of cornea and refractive surgery at the University of Florida. He is founding director and chief surgeon of the internationally famous Gulani Vision Institute and global CEO of the Gulani Surgical Institutes, headquartered in Jacksonville, Florida, USC. Dr. Gulani is internationally renowned for his inventions, groundbreaking innovations, and surgical techniques and publication. Dr. Glani is a master surgeon, teacher, award-winning inventor, and author who gave us a word on invitation to share his passion. Today, we asked him to join us. He was busy in surgery, but he was kind enough to share his time. And he's just came out of his surgical suit to be with us. He has super specialized in advanced LASIK, custom corneal and premium cataract surgery. Dr. Glani has unique work in the full spectrum of keratolenticular reflexive surgery known as tear to the custom design a specific surgical plan for each patient individually. And it's always among the first in the world to introduce the new tactics, new technologies and protocols as a consultant to the patients, eye surgeons and eye care industry itself. With an eye of an artist and a passion to help people see, he has turned Jacksonville, Florida into the vision destination center of the world. So all, of, from the, all over the world, patients are going there for their complication, especially. So welcome Dr. Gulani to this session. Thank you so much for having me. Can I? Sure, sir. Welcome, please. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Maskati and Dr. Arora for this invite. It's really a pleasure always to be among you as I believe you are all in India, some of the best eye surgeons in the world. So I'm just gonna share with you my attitude. Surgery, you all are already pretty good, but can I share my screen now? Yes. Are we okay there? Yes. Wonderful. So what I'm gonna share with you, as Dr. Rura just mentioned to you, Terigium has been around for thousands of years. It's one of the simplest pathologies that you see on people's eyes and yet, it's a surgery we give to residents and most people think nothing much of it. In fact, I think it's the most difficult thing I do in my practice where I do the most complex cases in the world. This surgery holds you accountable from day one because the patient's eye is open. And about attitude, what I want to teach you is exactly what I'm saying here. Cosmetic endpoints. Ocular surgery, surface surgery should be a cosmetic endpoint that is starting day one from surgery. In fact, I even started immediately in surgery to the patient and three decades of follow-up with this. When you see a pterygium and you see this kind of situation, you're looking at bitemporal pterygium in a patient who's had many previous surgeries, was flown to me, cornea has 11 diopters, stigmatism, vision's 2400, cornea looks bad, sclera looks bad. You know what I look at? I don't even see this pterygium. I look at in this patient's eye and I look at a perfect white sclera, perfect clear cornea, 
or fecimetropia, and the patients are candidate for premium cataract or laser vision surgery, whatever their age is. That's the attitude. If you can just grasp that from me, all the attendees, you got it. Because your surgery will become amazing and artistic as long as you can visualize the endpoint you want. Today, all day, I'm fixing keratoconus complications from all over the planet. And it's very important to me. I actually look for 2020. I'm refusing to accept that they cannot see 2020. That makes my surgery automatically artistic and six minutes long. So that's the important thing I'm stretching on this. So when I see this patient, I'm not looking at how many surgeries she had, how many surgeons she's seen. I want this. Are we all clear, please? Everything clear, corneas clear, and the patients in the mirror next day. All our patients are made to go up to the mirror next day. And this is very important for you to see because I want to make myself and all of you accountable. I can't believe my eyes. One more thing. All these patients are very, very intelligent. This is an attorney. Most of them are surgeons. But I, you see their reaction. It tells you how much they've suffered and how much your impact can be. Not just removing the pterygium, making them start <laughs> life. You what you say? Patients from different walks of life. I'll just go fast. Wow. A lot of my videos are on my YouTube. You can see at That's your leisure. But I want to share attitude with you. Perfect. Here are patients immediately out of surgery. Finished with your surgery. Look at the you white sclera. Look at the, the amniotic graft with the blue sitting there. Have Eye movements clear, perfect. Everything graft, great. Look at the patient so celebrating you, right on table. Surgery. There it is. The dissected uh, area. Look to your left. Other perfect. Area. Look straight ahead, please. And that's immediate from surgery. Do. Basil. So important. I shared all my work in a textbook I wrote to share with colleagues. And there are some very brilliant colleagues who have also co-authored in this. And we had a forward from Dick Linson, but it's important to me that I share attitude. Surgery, all of you can do, no big deal. Now, this was a study we have actually published. Again, all of this is online, you can look it up. But studies and all are one thing, I like to show you all outcomes and patient reaction. We have tons of videos of day one patients, and all patients very intelligent walk up people walking up to the mirror and how they react. You know how you For paucity of time, I'll keep going. These videos are all on my YouTube. Sure and great. people from all walks of life, very high IQ, well, how they react. I'm Next day, these honest. are my patients and how they put themselves on social media. You may not know, you might be sleeping at night after surgery. They are putting their photos out the very next day, showing how they see. These are people from different uh, cultures, different places, but same reaction. How they post on social media, holding you accountable. These are patients, some of them actually go and keep on posting their everyday reports. So imagine showing their eye every day to their colleagues. How much accountable are you? So please don't lower your guard, perform at that level. I expect that. Now, this is a three-step technique, sparkle, suture, sterigium, amniotic reconstruction, laminar keratectomy, meaning I want the cornea and sclera to be perfect, minimal to no use of cautery at all. I use the 64 blade as my eraser. Sparkle technique, speed, cosmetic endpoints immediately from surgery to long-term, like you mentioned, but no recurrence rate. You see all kinds of patients. This is a full surgery. Again, I'll send you to my YouTube to see it. Recurrent pterygium. Let's keep going for the attitude, how I arrange the surgical, even the planning of these surgeries, how we do, what is, whether it's topical, intralesional, and the overall experience for these patients. This is a cycle of patients who fly to me for pterygium and now pingecula. When you're confident of doing a pterygium so well, pingecula patients want you to correct them cosmetically. It's just like the fact that if you can fix every laser vision patient to perfection every time, you can tackle a patient with 0.3 diopter astigmatism because now you're confident and they are hurting. They need to be helped. These are patients 20 years post-op. Again, a lot of them surgeons, attorneys, but see their reactions and how they do. These are day one outcomes. You can see the size of the pterygium I remove. I call that the iceberg concept, meaning what you remove is just a piece. The entire root needs to come out. My tissue grading systems, vascular grading system. This to me is the most important way of grading a pterygium and deciding what you will feel in surgery. If you can see all these outcomes day one, and 12 years post up lateral pterygium. Again, to me, it doesn't matter if it's bitemporal, lateral, superior. Your outcome has to be exactly what you visualize. And think about the patient in the mirror next day while you're operating. So you will not make a single mistake. That's the attitude I want. Lateral pterygium here. All kinds, recurrent pterygium. Also, recurrent pterygiums are the easiest to do. Let me repeat that. Many people make a big hoo-hoo about it. The previous surgeon did bad. The previous surgeon did whatever, but reached bare sclera, whether you like it or not. The point is to find that spot and then the whole thing lifts up like I call an armor plate. Very little bleeding. If there's bleeding, you're me, it means you're in the wrong plane. So these are patients recurrent and how they become patients for vision corrective surgery in the near future. The minimal reactions that I've seen, subamniotic blood, which uh, automatically clears itself because of the T-seal glue that I use. 
Patients with these bitemporal growths can also be corrected, like I showed you, how they react in the mirror. Patients who have come to me with bitemporal growths with multiple surgeries, you can use the tenons as a feeder graft with your amniotic graft. Patients who have had surgeries where they've had scleral melts of a very, very horrible kind, you can use Ologen, AMT. Again, remember, it's not about fixing the problem. It's about making it amazing while you're fixing it. That's the attitude. Patients with these kind of melts, you can use lamella cornea, you can use tutograph, you can use conjunctiva, you can use tenons. Whatever you use, cosmetic endpoints should not be forgotten. I don't want to see somebody shows me a surgery of gory blood and horrible stuff. I want to see the patient in the mirror, on table, saying, I'm amazed. That endpoint, if we can do, then I'm done with my talk today. Here are the ways we can use pedicles of the same tenon coming up to feed the area. These are the procedures that we've helped patients, a lot of them, fixing their eyebrow complications with amniotic tissue. You can use all modalities. Also, don't forget, a lot of these patients coming to you today have had LASIK or cataract surgery. You don't want to damage that vision. So maintain that LASIK flap. Do not ever use a blade on the cornea. When I see a doctor using blade on the cornea, I know they don't understand vision corrective surgery. That's how simple it is. You cannot damage vision. Once you've done these surgeries elegantly, these patients years later are still candidates for premium cataract, laser vision surgery, and you can again bring them to look good, see good concept. And you can see how these patients celebrate multifocal, trifocal lenses. Even here, patients who are told that they need to have all these grafts and artificial corneas. I don't believe with all that. I always believe fight. Show me that there could be failure first and have an attitude of success. Here we did AMT followed by ICL in this patient. You can see patients where you can combine your surgeries. When you remove a large syringe and you leave a scar, you can do corneoplastic, laser vision, three minutes surgery, bring them to perfect vision. And here's how these patients celebrate. These are 70 year old patients. Imagine the impact you had on their life by making them look great, confidence comes back, and then vision corrective surgery and they can jump out of planes and enjoy their life. So it's very, very important. A lot of these patients of Pingekula that people say, it's okay, you're Wayne, they're not Wayne. I have patients even today who have come from Hong Kong, Australia, so they've flown so far for a pingecula. Understand the pain they are feeling. They are self-conscious. They are very, very affected by what people are thinking about them. They're even to the point of being depressed. I have level six levels for why these people fly. So it is our duty to perform perfection because in a pingecula, if you mess up, you took them from a nice eye to a horrible eye, not a complicated eye. You get me? So the confidence has to be very high. All this stuff is on YouTube. I just want to wrap up for you on time. Any questions? I'll keep three more minutes if there's anything I can do. Go ahead, please. We're not your mute. Hello? We're not your mute. Okay. I think the message is very clear. You have to have an attitude to do the things. You have to look the white eye before doing your surgery. In and any surgery, doctor, yes, any yes. surgery I see, whether it's RK or white cataract or a dangling cataract, I do not like doctors showing me surgical acrobatics. I want to see the patient without anesthesia, with numbing drops, coming out 2020 with a subluxated white cataract in the only eye of an attorney. Like, I want that attitude, and I know the skills are there. I do not like doctors making everything look complex and then trying to find a solution. Nothing's complex. The patient comes to you, they trust you. Perform. I do not want people just publishing data. The patient should be going, I'm blown away with this outcome. So yes, doc, I'm on attitude and all of you have the skills. Every pterygium patient, even if you're just starting doctors, put them in the mirror next day. It'll make you accountable, just as accountable as our LASIK patients, which 20 years ago, people said, doc, why are you fighting for 2020? 2040 is good enough. No, make them go to the mirror and your surgery will improve automatically. Don't have to see any surgery. It'll become artistic. Thanks, Arun. That was uh, the, the, as 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 usual, uh, the perfect uh, curtain raiser for the session to follow on the intricacies of pterygium and the techniques and all that. We'll let you go back to your surgery. Your patients need you, and uh, we know. Let's go on with the uh, show. Thanks, Arun, again Thank you. for sparing you your so time. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Just a minute. I'm missing my slides. I want to share them. So we move on to the next presentation. I think the message is very, very 
clear in terigen surgery just trying to connect i think it's not only the uh, surgical part where you have to remove the uh, terigium you have to avoid the recurrence and second you have to approach the cosmesis that's again very very important so if you take care of all these things I'm missing something B6. Are my slides visible now? Yeah. No, it is Dr. Slides, slides, yeah. Pardon? It is Dr. Arrow's slides are seen. Yeah, yeah. So uh, he spoke very well on uh, sparkle technique he was telling about. That means getting a clear and white cornea, white conjectiva on the next day. So let's move further. We have with us none other than Dr. Kuresh B. Muscati, whom I respect, one of the most respected person in Indian ophthalmology. He has been the president of All India Ophthalmology Society from 2014 to 15. He was president of the Cornea Society of India. He is the president of Bombay Ophthalmic Association in 2000-2001. He was president of the Maharashtra Ophthalmic Society. He was the chairman of IC, MSICS. Chairman of SAO PSA, that's SARC Pediatric and Establishment Association. He has got a Lifetime Achievement Award from Escarascaras, that's International Society of Cornea and Refractive Surgeon. He is uh, one of the most renowned teacher, I should say. I've learned so many things from Professor Kurish Muscati that I, I can't tell you. So, so many small tips, so many things I learned. Today, Dr. Kurish Muscati is going to speak on say no to bare scleral technique and tips for optimal outcome. Professor Muscati said, Dr. Muscati said. Thank you. Thank you, Vinod. So after that exhilarating, I would call a uh, lecture by uh, Arun on uh, where, where he, uh, you got a fleeting glimpse that perhaps his technique is uh, uh, excision of the pterygium without putting a blade on the cornea and uh, an amniotic graft, I think, is what uh, he does. Uh, let us go on to a little basics before we introduce a wealth of videos to follow from Dr. Paras and Dr. Shrish. So pterygium, we know, is the, the basically a growth which is there due to sunlight. It occurs more in places which have high sunlight when we look at America, the uh, reports of pterygium are more in California than in New York because there is more sunlight in California than in New York. So it's sunlight which damages the conjunctiva and makes the uh, conjunctiva grow across the limbus and break the barrier of the limbus and invade the cornea. We know because of Professor Minas Coronio from Australia that it's commoner on the nasal side because the nose reflects the light coming from the sun to reflect more onto the nasal side and therefore there is more pterygium on the nasal side. The P53 oncogene has been implicated. We know that there is a localized stem cell deficiency. Whenever blood vessels or tissue grow across the limbus, there has to be a stem cell deficiency which causes this. This stem cell deficiency is perhaps because of sunlight. We know that the, the pathology when we examine the pterygium under a microscope, that there is hyaline and elastotic de degeneration in the subconjunctival tissue and recurrent pterygium behaves more like a tumor. So not every pterygium needs to be removed, just like not every keratoconus requires a, a CX cell to be done. There has to be some indication, some reason for removal, either because there is decreased vision or the irregular astigmatism. Arun referred to one patient with 11 diopters of astigmatism, or there is an increased tear film breakup because of the increased surface area from which the tear breaks up. Other indications could be just cosmetic deformity, patient is an actor, actress, or just somebody who is has an inferiority complex or a, a depressed person who wants to look better. And, and uh, we find that, that, that there is an enough indication to go ahead with the procedure. So there has to be some reason besides the fattening of the surgeon's wallet, uh, which, which is required. So the surgical approaches, unfortunately, even in 2022, I am still seeing patients coming to me with recurrence where the previous surgery has been a bare sclera technique. We know that the recurrence rate is anywhere from one third of all pterygia to 90% of them. 
and we know that the that the that the best technique now is conjunctival autografting um, autologous conjunctiva from the same patient from the same eye if possible um, amniotic membrane is the next best um, uh, it has a little higher recurrence rate if we know this why in 2022 is are we still uh, uh, having to tackle bare sclera techniques why am i even having to talk about it because residents when i talk to them or the referring surgeon when i talk to him why did you do this he says well you know this i could do topical this the um, uh, if if i have to do a conjunctival autograft it will require significant amount of anesthesia i've got 17 cataracts to do it increases my operative time patient is more discomfort here i simply yank off the terigem and forget about it there'll be scarring at the donor site later how can i do a trabeculectomy if he gets glaucoma and there are complications i know of like graft edema etc so these are some of the excuses people give to still do bare sclera technique uh, i uh, am a great fan of dr joseph i'm just skipping from point to point so dr joseph rook perry of israel i'm a great fan of his he does uh, uh, mitomycin c in every patient i do mitomycin c in every uh, patient both uh, recurrent terigia and primary terigia and uh, there are complications associated with this but most of the complications of mitomycin c have occurred when they when it has been used with a bare sclera technique so if you use mitomycin and cover it with a conjunctival autograft the um, the, the uh, complications of mitomycin c mitomycin c are much less we know that ocular surface transplant and our two next speakers dr paras and dr shreesh are going to take you through the nuances of the surgery uh, both in primary uh, cag or in bad cases where you might not be able to do a the simple conjunctival autograft you might have to do double grafts or annular grafts or bucket angle grafts uh, conjunctival autograft is not a new procedure it was uh, started by shefer saying and kenyan way back in 1985 the first published reports i trained under dr kenyan in usa where he took free conjunctival graft from superior temporal bulba conjunctiva and their first reports were low recurrence rate of 5 to 8% and this hasn't changed the recurrence rate has just gone lower and they recommended it for recurrent and advanced primary at that time now of course we use it for every patient so this is in essence what it means that you take the conjunctiva from the superior bulbar conjunctiva or the superior temporal if it's a nasal terigium and you slide it across after making it a free graft you slide it across and uh, in the old days of course it was sutured in place now you can use glue or you can use the patient's own blood to stick it into place so this is in essence what a conjunctiva autograft is and we know from dr donald tan who was one of the earliest to publish this series where the simple bare sclera bs is bare sclera in primary cases 61% recurrence rate as opposed to uh, uh, conjunctival autograft with 1.6 recurrence rate and in a in a recurrent terigium bare sclera technique 82% recurrence rate while in his series in a recurrent technique in a recurrent where conjunctival autograft was done there was 0% recurrence so it it the facts and figures speak for themselves i am not such a great surgeon so i avoid showing you my pictures this is donald tan 2002 uh, it rivals uh, um, uh, arun gulani's uh, uh, patients it only shows that you need to be a good surgeon and an even better photographer to get these uh, uh, results uh, you do get complications from uh, 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 surgery you do enough surgery you will get complications but these are all solvable complications and most of the time you can end up Uh, with pictures like this so the, the um, uh, there are various ways to skin a cat you can i start from the in a primary terigium i will start from the uh, corneal side i you can use the blade of your choice a blade breaker and a, and a blade part parker 15 number a beaver blade or uh, what have you and you can cut it from the from this side from that side uh, we'll go into the techniques so you get a the bare sclera at one point then i like to uh, polish this with a polisher this is a diamond dust polisher mine is manual you get automated as well you get dental burrs which you can use or people don't use anything at all if you are a good surgeon and a very clean surgeon you can get away without even use of any burr to polish and smoothen the surface and then you 
the mark the area where you're taking the conjunctival autograph from with a pen, same marker pen that you use for refractive surgeries. And I like to cut outside the mark so that the mark is visible. The thinner the graft, the better it is. Don't do a deep dissection. So this is a big no-no. You should not take the tenons with you. Take a superficial, as superficial as possible without buttonholing. This is the ideal uh, graft to take. So take a thin tenons, a, a tenon-free graft. Uh, uh, excise the limbal conjunctiva last, keep the graft moist, make sure you orient it correctly and either suture it or, or use the patient's own blood or glue to stick it into place. You can leave the donor area bare to re or you can, if you've got uh, spare am amnion or if you've got spare tissue or you can even pull the conjunctiva there and stick it into place. So this is how it looks after it has been uh, stuck. So just a few tips for success. Don't be stingy on your graft. There's lots of conjunctiva, large, generous graft, adequate removal of the fibrovascular tissue, which is below, as Dr. Arun said, the tip on the iceberg. So the, uh, uh, you need to remove much more tissue in a recurrent than in a primary, but the subconjunctival tissue must be cleaned. Uh, take care of the muscle. See that you don't damage the muscle. You can hook up the muscle, especially in recurrent pterygium, so that you have a clean area you can even cover it with a sleeve of amnion if you have to. Uh, and as I said, you can use any ways to uh, stick the graft into place. There are complications, early and late complications of pterygium surgery, but this is not to dissuade you from doing this. I thank you for your attention. I want to end by just saying, please do a conjunctival autograft or at least an amnion for every pterygium, whether it's a virgin pterygium or a recurrent pterygium. And my next two speakers, Dr. Paras and Shreesh, are going to reiterate this fact to you. And uh, both of them being better surgeons than me are going to show you videos uh, of the uh, surgical technique little by little, uh, step by step, so that all of us at the end of the day will become masters of every pterygium, whether it's virgin or recurrent. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I think the message is very clear that one should not do a bare stera technique anymore. The recurrence rate is very, very high. And we have got you know, a lot of techniques of conjectural grafting. I think our next speakers will be sharing with us and we should avoid bare sclera. Uh, sir, I was just seeing a video day before in Dr. Devan's library. He has shown an Egyptian surgeon who was professor, he was a professor there. He's doing the bare sclera, but he's taking out the tenons one millimeter just leaving the conjunctiva there and just dissecting out the uh, tenons one millimeter inside also. That leaves a frill of uh, clear conjunctiva. So he has reported good results. I'm not sure about uh, his publication or anything. I just saw a video uh, last night. So I'm not yeah. sure that technique will work or not. Yeah, there are, there, are, there are also ways in which people have described turning the pterygium so that the head faces the, um, the um, uh, medial side. And the tail faces the uh, and doing, but these the cosmetic results are not so good because the that conjunctiva is 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 discolored conjunctiva. It is uh, not healthy looking. I have tried it at times, very rarely, but the cosmetic result there is no recurrence. But the patient is not happy with cosmesis, so it's it's not um, the ideal. There is also the perfect technique, and there are many techniques. You know, I think once Paras and Shreesh have finished, then we'll cover some of the other techniques which they have. With they may leave out. Yeah. Okay. Sure, sir. Sure. So moving on to the next talk. We have with us Dr. Paras Mehta. She is medical director and coronial surgeon at Samip Eye Hospital Cornea Center since 1993 after finishing a long-term cornea fellowship from LV Prashad Eye Institute, Hyderabad. She did a short-term fellowship at Manhattan Eye and an here in Fermi, New York, USA in 96. She is honorary medical director to LMAX I Bank and Shri Bhai Chand and Mehta Corneal Transplant Center, Vadodara. Uh, she has several publications to his credit and many presentations uh, to his, her credit. Has presented papers and instruction courses at Asia Corner Society meetings and APO meetings also. Served as president of Baroda Ophthalmical Society for the year 2008 and 2009. Served as Vassal member of the EBAI and on the advisory board of EBVI, uh, that's IBank Institution of India. Uh, she conducts two day, that's weekend meet 
focus meeting on various coronary disease and surgical techniques once in every two years at Medical Center Trust, uh, but other since the year 2004. It's very, very popular among the corneal surgeons and general ophthalmologists also. Our area of interest are ocular surface disease, infectious keratitis, and labular corneal surgery procedures. Today, she's going to speak on terrorism surgery with CAG, CLAG, AMG, and handling double pterygia. Over to you, Dr. Paras. Uh, thank you, sir, for that kind introduction. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Kuresh Maskati and Dr. Vinod Arora for giving me this opportunity to share my views on this uh, subject. Um, I would just like to share my screen. Are you able to see my screen, sir? Yes. Thank you. So uh, essentially, I would be covering pterygium, sur primary pterygium sur surgical techniques. Uh, most of the top, I mean, uh, points were covered by Dr. Maskati very well, and he's generous enough in saying that, you know, I mean, the surgical part would be covered by the other two speakers. Uh, essentially, here, what I've done is, uh, like, I would be... Uh, like, you know, I mean, showing some videos and we would be discussing the steps of the pterygium surgery. So pterygium comes to us in various forms. As you can see here, it could be double-headed or it could be cystic, very advanced, early, involving the cornea. The major surgical indications, as we know, are number one is cosmetic blemish. The other is if it is causing a lot of visual disturbance, as in this clinical picture, as you can see on the screen, or sometimes restricted eye movements, uh, can also, it, it is so much so, and there's so much fibrosis that it can lead to uh, restriction of the eye movements as well. As you can see here, the topography is quite bad here. So one of the major primary aim of the surgery is to prevent the recurrence and achieve a good cosmetic and functional outcome, which was reiterated by the first speaker as well as Dr. Maskati. Uh, you can see that, you know, you can achieve a wonderful surgical outcome by selecting an appropriate technique for a pterygium surgery. And these are the pre and post topographic pictures of the same patient. And you can see a C difference in the astigmatism. So the reported rates for occurrences show a wide range varying from as low as 2% to as high as 80%, and which may be influenced by the surgical technique adapted for pterygium excision. So there are various techniques which are being practiced by number of people. Uh, we know that there are a plethora of surgical techniques, including Bears Lera, conjunctival autograph, using amniotic membrane, so on and so forth. But we all know that out of all the published data, the surgical technique of pterygium excision with conjunctival autograph has been considered the gold standard with very low recurrence rate, as low as almost 2% is against the all higher surgical rate, I mean, recurrence rates with the other techniques. So today I would be sharing that technique with you. So essentially, in another 10, 12 minutes, what we would do is uh, I would just go through, you know, video assisted surgical nuances of primary pterygium surgery. And I guess the recurrence, uh, recurrent pterygium is being discussed by Dr. Shrish. So this is a surgical video of a primary pterygium. Uh, sometimes you can inflate the conjunctiva with, you know, I mean, local anesthetic and uh, divide the uh, uh, pterygium head at the limbus. I prefer to do it slightly inside the limbus so that my uh, conjunctival graft need is lower. You can mark the conjunctival graft so that you don't end up having a smaller or a larger graft that gives you a, an optimal size of the graft, which can be, you know, as uh, Dr. Maskati said, it should be as thin as possible without any tenons capsule. And I prefer not to lift it. I just rotate it on the cornea. Use a fibrin glue. You can use fibrin glue or you can use, you know, sutures to cover, I mean, a suture that graft to the uh, recipient bed. Here I have used both the components of fibrin glue, one after the other. You need very little amount of fibrin glue to kind of, you know, allow this graft to stick to the uh, recipient bed. Now we'll just go through these steps. Sorry, I mean, I'll move to the other. We'll go through these, uh, you know, nuances of these uh, steps with different videos. Now, the like, you know, I mean, in a detailed way, like tackling the head of the pterygium, what I do is I use limbus as a reference plane. I prefer to cut little inside the limbus 
so that you can you know separate these tenons and conjunctiva well and your you know i mean graft size requirement is smaller you can peel it off from the surface of the uh, cornea with the help of fine forceps using uh, another you know i mean uh, counter pressure along with and you can eventually uh, clean the corneal surface with fine forceps as well or as dr maskati was mentioning you can use diamond bar or you can use the lamellar dissectors to make sure that the corneal surface is clean sometimes you are you know i mean you you are dealing with a very young patient and you don't need only conjunctival autograft you need conjunctival limbal autograft because you want to address the deficiency of the limbal stem cells and there you would like to include some of the limbal stem cells into the conjunctival grafts so how do we do that harvesting a conjunctival limbal graft would be done in this manner once you have reflected the conjunctival graft you can bisect this you know limbus with the help of 24 gauge needle so that you can incorporate partial limbal stem cells into your graft edge and you can see that that graft edge would be a little thicker and you can use the same graft onto the graft bed this technique was popularized by professor minas coronio and i adapted that technique and after that you know for even young patients i have had very minimal uh, recurrence rate Uh, this is a young patient a 34 year old male uh, who is a welder by profession you can see that it is a very huge pterygium onto the cornea almost involving half of the cornea and even half of the pupillary area uh, obviously he is a welder by profession you know that because of the actinic damage he has developed this his visual acuity was counting finger 3 meters and he needed a functional and cosmetic correction both so let's look at the surgical uh, procedure here in this case as well as you see that i always prefer to take it slightly inside the limbus so that you save onto the conjunctiva here there is lot of fibrosis so you remove subconjunctival tissue adequately so that uh, you don't have that you know i mean flashy uh, body left at the end of the surgery and uh, make sure that the side of the pterygium is also well taken care of here i have made a little difference that i am removing the healthy epithelium first so that when i am peeling the pterygium from the surface of the cornea it is easier to peel from the surface and you can have a nice clean plane and you can assist that with the help of either the scissors blade or you can use any other spatula to you know remove rest of the uh, pterygium head it's important to clean the limbus thoroughly and do use a minimum cautery because the area which was larger i have used single suture of vicryl uh, tenovicryl to uh, suture that conjunctiva here so that you can have you require a smaller uh, donor graft now the graft is uh, the size is measured and you can mark your graft onto the superior bulbar conjunctiva start dissecting here what i do is i generally prefer to uh, create a small uh, hole into the conjunctiva and pass the uh, blunt conjunctival scissors between the conjunctiva and the tenons so that you can have a very thin conjunctival graft without the tenons without actually cutting the tenons and all throughout the uh, procedure you make sure that the sheen of the uh, steel is seen underneath the conjunctiva so, so you know that you are under the conjunctiva and not below the uh, tenons capsule once the graft is fashioned you can see that this was a young patient i am also incorporating the limbal stem cells partial limbal stem cells so then it is cut with the scissors and it is applied to the recipient bed with the help of tissue glue what i prefer to do is i check for the sizing initially then again bring back that graft onto the corneal surface you look look for the sizing initially before applying the glue bring it back in the similar manner onto the cornea apply both the drops of you know both the components of fibrin glue and bring it back to the uh, recipient bed here one tip i would like to share is uh, keep it little away from the limbus so that you allow the corneal epithelium to grow over the limbus because there was lot of involvement of the cornea i am also using an amniotic membrane graft here to suture onto the surface of the cornea so that post operatively the epithelialization is much better and the scarring is much less so the surface heals much better the uh, amniotic membrane graft is fixed with both uh, parallel two sutures at the limbus on both the sides and the fibrin glue in between so that it does not slide in the post operative phase so this is how it looked post operatively this is the picture on the extreme left of view is the 
uh, on uh, clinical appearance on the uh, presentation this is uh, the second picture shows the uh, appearance post surgery immediately within a week's time in the last days by 4 to 6 weeks is bcva improved from counting finger 3 meters to 6x with good cosmetic and functional outcome with stable corneal surface one can alter alternatively use combine this with conjunctival autograph and many a times a mini slit can be performed either from the same eye or from the other eye as well so these were his uh, pre operative topography which is on the left hand side and post op topography at 6 weeks you can see a see difference between the astigmatism the uh, cylinder drop down from 10. Point 3 h to almost minus 1.54 and the surface looks much stable. Sometimes you are dealing with double pterygia. So how do you harvest, you know, double uh, graft? It's very simple. You just have to, you know, I mean, mark two grafts, but make sure that the size of the graft which is required is much smaller so that you don't sacrifice much of the conjunctiva. And the dissection is essentially the same as I showed it in previous surgical videos. Uh, both the graphs are uh, dissected. What I prefer to do here is the area which has a larger pterygium, usually it is a nasal pterygium. There I prefer to take that limbal ledge so that there is not recurrence of the pterygium. As you can see here, lightly I am putting a small incision by setting the limbus and that ledge is taken, which would be that graft would go on to the nasal side where there was a larger pterygium, while the other uh, graft would go on to the temporal side where it was a relatively a smaller pterygium comparatively so that the chances of recurrence would be low and rest of the application of the graph would be same as I've shown into the previous videos. So the surgical uh, to just reiterate the surgical nuances use limbus I use limbus as a reference plane incising inside limbus of conjunctiva and in turn allows optimal sizing of the conjunct uh, conjunctiva autograph as well as conjunctiva limbal autograph. Limbal clock cover involvement will also help decide the length of the conjunctival autograft. Keep the conjunctival autograft little away from the limbus to allow the corneal epithelium to cross over the limbus because corneal epithelium is phenotypically different. And if the corneal epithelium heals fast, first, then the chances of recurrence will be minimized. Uh, opt for a tenance free uh, uh, conjunctival autograft or a limbal autograft. Marking always helps in avoiding graft cross disparity as well as helps in maintaining the orientation of the graft. To avoid recurrence on the sides of the conjunctival sides, uh, the conjunctival autograft, I mean, you, you attend to the knuckles of the pterygium. Peel, peeling of the uh, head of the pterygium helps maintaining the better plane onto the ocular surface. And a few other things like if you are, use, if you are not using a fibrin glue, and you are using a glueless technique, maybe wait for sufficient time to allow the graft to settle on the recipient or a scleral bed. Here it is very, very mandatory that your conjunctival graft should be very, very thin so that it sticks to the uh, scleral bed very well. The limbus can be splitted or small ledge also can be taken. You can even, instead of taking a full splitted limbus, you can also take a small ledge of about one clock hour uh, with extended dissection for cases needing clack like young patients with fleshy pterygia, a very aggressive pterygia. So this is just a two minute uh, video to just reiterate the nuances which I spoke about. Uh, always dissect it inside the limbus so that your graft requirement is much less, which we do it for recurrent pterygia as well. Try to peel it off from the surface so that your corneal plane is very good. Remove subconjunctival tenons or subconjunctival tissue thoroughly well. And also attend to the sides very well so that you don't have a recurrence coming from there where you are seeing right now I'm dissecting. Right? And clean the limbus a little more carefully. Measure the graft size. Here the graft size required is about, you know, I mean, uh, 5 by 7 or 4 by 6 or sometimes 5 by 8, not much. Mark your uh, graft very well with the marking pen, or you could use it. The marking pen tip is very broad. You could use, you know, tip of your uh, dialer so that you can uh, demonstrate that surgery in a neater way. And uh, dissect the conjunctiva very well. Create a fashion, a conjunctival graft. The advantage of, you know, I mean, marking is you would never have a shorter graft or a larger graft. You, your size would be perfect. Otherwise, if you pull the conjunctiva and cut, maybe your graft eventually would be much smaller. You can see here that the graft is very thin and I'm just removing excess tenons from there. 
a graph is cut because here I'm using a conjunctival autograph rather than a limbus. So I'm not dissecting the limbus. This is not lifted. It is just pulled onto the surface of the cornea. So you don't lose orientation of the conjunctival graph. Check for the, you know, I'm in sizing before you apply the glue. Then apply the glue fibrinogen and thrombin one after the other. Lift the recipient conjunctiva a little bit so that the glue slides underneath also. So there is no retraction of that conjunctiva. And make sure that the edges are opposed very well. And iron this, you know, I mean, conjunctival graph either with tying forceps or maybe you could use a spatula so that an excess amount of glue is ironed very well. And oppose the edges of the conjunctival graft as well as the recipient conjunctiva very well so that there is no retraction or no possibility of, you know, I mean, granuloma formation. I prefer to cover the donor area with the same conjunctiva, applying one or two drops of fibrin glue, and that gives that makes the patient very comfortable in the post-operative phase. So you can have wonderful results post-operatively. So to take to come back to you know take home points, primary pterygium surgery can give best surgical outcome both functional and cosmetic with meticulous examination, selecting and using the right surgical technique with an appropriate post-operative care. Recurrence rate can definitely significantly be minimized by choosing an appropriate technique for a particular patient. Thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Paras, for an excellent presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Just one question for the novice uh, the surgeons who are starting. Certain the conjunctival trap rolls up, it crumbles up. And what are the tips to know whether it's upside down or uh, how you can recognize that? Uh, the simplest tip is you would have a merosol sponge and or the Johnson bath Q-tip. If you touch it to the stromal side, it would stick to that area. If it is an epithelial side, it would not stick. The other way of checking it is using a fluorescent strip. Many a times when we are working in a teaching institute, uh, the graft is, you know, I mean, uh, attached upside down and you just put in a fluorescent, you would be able to recognize that the graft is attached upside down. But simplest on table is you, your, you know, I mean, on the stromal side, uh, the butt would stick to that side. Same thing is true for, you know, I mean, checking for the uh, amniotic membrane also, which side is stromal and which is epithelial side. Uh, you know, the, just to add, uh, I mark on three sides with the, the marker pen and we cut outside the mark. So then your orientation becomes easier. The marked side, the blue things which you can, you can see clearly, that's the outer surface and the stromal surface underneath. Also, because if you mark on three sides and you don't mark on the limber side, your orientation becomes easy. And as Dr. Paras reiterated again and again, don't lift. When you lift the, 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 the graft up, then it tends to curl up um, uh, and become a ball, or then you find it difficult. But if you have not lifted, you, you've just stretched it onto the cornea. Cornea is like your ironing board. So you, like you stretch a cloth there when you want to iron. So the cornea helps you a lot by being an ironing board. It's not in use just now. You're working on the conjunctiva. So stretch it over there so that your orientation is maintained. 100% Dr. Baskati. I do the same. I cut it out at the marking points so that you have the markings available there. Absolutely. One more simple point to add. Uh, this uh, epithelial surface usually is glistening, uh, but the uh, stromal surface usually will have packs of uh, tenons. And uh, epithelial side, the limbal end of the epithelial side, you have this pigmentation. So uh, these are some of the anatomical uh, uh, findings which you can. Uh, True. So, with the so we will continue the discussion and move over to next talk. Our uh, next speaker is Dr. Sheesh Kumar. He is medical superintendent and senior consultant, cornea refractive and cataract services at the I Foundation at Coimbatore. He has done more than 350 scientific presentations at national and international conferences. He has uh, 62 publications in his uh, peer reviewed journals to his credit. He has six, written six textbook chapters. He has received various awards like Dr. C.P. Gupta Best Paper Award. Shri Prasad Hardia, the best paper award, AIUC award for the best paper presentation in the external disease, MN award for the best paper in cataract session, TNOA gold medal for peer reviewed uh, publications. He has got best paper in the session awards 
uh, 40 NO for 2004, 2009, 2017, 2019, at US in 2007 and 10. So there's a long list. And he's the principal investigator for the uh, several drugs and clinical trials and innovations. He has developed CANVEC CCC, that's uh, using a cannula and vacuum, creating that instrument cataract. And second is conjectival tissue grafting from pterygium. And star CANVEC CC, Rexes, I think that's getting a very popularity now. So let us uh, go to the talk. So Dr. Shish, today we'll be speaking on neuroocular surface transplant techniques and my technique for recurrent pterygia. Dr. Shish, please. Uh, Shrish, before you start, one more claim to fame. Uh, I, I am attaching myself is that way back, I think 20 years ago or so, Shrish and I were two uh, co-instructors for a pterygium course at the was it Academy or AS, AS? I think it was ASCRS. Uh, it is the Miyajo, sir. It is Miyajo in uh, Bahrain. No, but uh, uh, was it Miyajo? Okay, yeah. yeah. Miyako, yeah. Miyako, Miyako. Miyako. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> thanks, uh, Dr. Vinodarara, for the nice introduction. I, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Muskati, Dr. Vinod, for the opportunity given to me. And uh, so I am going to talk on newer surface transplantation uh, techniques for pterygium and uh, management of uh, recurrent pterygium uh, and a few tips to prevent recurrence of pterygium, uh, uh, recurrence of pterygium following uh, uh, surgery. So many of uh, uh, the surgeons still consider uh, the humble pterygium to be unworthy of their uh, talent and skill. And this uh, trivialization of uh, pterygium surgery combined with poor surgical technique are responsible for poor or uh, variable surgical outcomes. So uh, it's uh, one of the commonest problems uh, we encounter in our day-to-day -day practice. And uh, if you don't follow a proper surgical technique, uh, you may have poor or variable outcome as such. Uh, we do not have set protocols uh, as to how to manage different types of pterygia. Uh, however, uh, we know that pterygium is considered as a focal uh, uh, deficiency, focal limbal deficiency. It is uh, because of the uh, uh, deficiency of limbal stem cells due to uh, ultraviolet light induced damage to the limbal stem cells. So, Ocular surface transplantation uh, uh, procedures have been found to be effective. The goal of uh, any uh, pterygium surgery, it should prevent recurrence. And the procedure should act like a limbal barrier and the procedure should have minimal or no complications. And it should be cosmetically acceptable to the patient as well as to the surgeon. And that should be visual improvement. Uh, Dr. Paras has shown uh, a uh, few topographic pictures before and after the surgery. Uh, surgery. There's a drastic reduction in uh, astigmatism. So, so there will be significant improvement after uh, pterygium surgery if there is induced astigmatism because of uh, pterygium. So we have uh, various surface transplantation procedures uh, that are available. Uh, we all know conjunctival autografting is the gold standard in the management of pterygium. Uh, However, uh, it is not possible in all the cases. So, like you have other uh, modifications of conjunctival uh, transplantation. So like conjunctival limbal autografting, conjunctival autografting with slit, and conjunctival tissue graft from the pterygium or uh, amniotic membrane transplantation. So as such, uh, again, uh, we do not have any set uh, protocols or guidelines. Uh, as to how to go about managing different types of pterygium. A variety of procedures have been proposed. Uh, however, uh, they have, many of them have their own merits and the limitations. Uh, and with the experience gained over the years, we can claim that uh, conjunctival autografting is the gold standard for the management of uh, simple uh, single head uh, primary pterygium. 
and uh, if that is not possible if there is availability of amniotic membrane you can go ahead and do amniotic membrane transplantation and if both are not available you can take a graft from the conjunctival pterygium tissue itself and uh, use it for uh, grafting that is conjunctival tissue grafting from the pterygium and uh, double head pterygium primary double head pterygium you can split the conjunctival graft uh, either vertically or horizontally or you can take two separate grafts from superior and inferior bulbar conjunctiva. Uh, you can either use a amniotic membrane transplantation or conjunctival tissue graft from the pterygium itself. I'm coming to that uh, later. Uh, recurrent pterygium, again, conjunctival autografting is uh, uh, useful for uh, recurrent pterygium and you can even include a thin block of uh, tissue from the <coughs> peripheral cornea, limbal conjunctival autografting or you can combine conjunctival autografting with slit, or you can use some MMC or amniotic membrane as adjunctives for the primary uh, procedure. So oh, like, uh, uh, as we all know, we do conjunctival autografting for most of the cases of uh, pterygia. It is automatic choice for uh, most of the cases of primary pterygia. However, there are occasions where the superior bulbar conjunctiva is not available or uh, it is scarred because of uh, the previous surgeries or it is because of the uh, glaucoma filtering surgery uh, blem being there or in a patient who is a glaucoma suspect or a patient who has a double head pterygium. In such cases, uh, you can take a graph from the conjunctiva uh, of the pterygium itself. This is just a small animation to show this. You just uh, separate the epithelial sheet from the pterygium and uh, keep it aside and uh, remove all the fibrovascular uh, tissue of the pterygium and uh, then place this uh, sheet, epithelial sheet from the pterygium itself and uh, either glue it or uh, you can uh, suture it. Histopathologically, it's been uh, seen that a section of normal conjunctiva had two to four uh, layers. This is a normal conjunctiva, which has got uh, two to four layers of epithelium with uh, no dysplasia or no malignancy. Whereas the conjunctiva overlying the pterygium was found to be uniformly thick. It's a thick uh, eight to 12 layered uh, uh, structure, epithelial cell structure uh, with the few goblet cells and capillary networks, but with the similar absence of granuloma or dysplasia, thus making it a good source for uh, 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 grafting in selected cases or indicated cases. So uh, this is a case uh, where I am uh, demonstrating the conjunctival tissue graft from the pterygium. I usually inject uh, uh, lignocaine uh, into the pterygium tissue uh, uh, to raise a blip and uh, separate the conjunctiva from the underlying uh, fibrovascular tissue. It is a little difficult to obtain a thin graft from the pterygium tissue itself uh, because of the th thickness. Uh, it is a thick graft. Uh, and uh, it's less elastic as compared to the virgin conjunctiva. Uh, but you can take a graft, you can place it on the vasculeral bed and cover it. So any vasculera is a potential source for conjunctivalization. So you have to cover it with the, some epithelial sheet. Thus it reduces the recurrence. So we publish these uh, cases. It's concomitant use of conjunctival tissue graft from the pterygium itself without rotation in pterygium surgery. Uh, it is published in the year 2018 and in IJO. And we had excellent results. We included around 82 cases in this particular series and uh, the recurrence rate was less than 4%. Uh, and uh, uh, subsequently, uh, we compared it uh, with inferior conjunctival grafting uh, and uh, conjunctival tissue grafting because uh, both share a similar indication. If the superior bulbar conjunctiva is uh, not available for uh, transplantation, you take uh, either an inferior conjunctival autograft or uh, you can take a graft from the conjunctival tissue graft uh, from the pterygium itself. So for similar indications, you can use these two procedures and uh, they are comparable. If you see the results, uh, they are comparable. Both the techniques of uh, inferior conjunctival autography and conjunctival tissue graft from the pterygium itself, uh, they are excellent alternate options with comparable outcomes and uh, no additional risk of significant complications. Coming to double head pterygium, uh, 
Dr. Paras has covered a uh, few surgeries uh, she has mentioned, and uh, uh, I'm not going to repeat those surgeries. So you can either do a conjunctival uh, autografting, so in the form of superior and inferior bulbar conjunctival autografting for this double head pterygia, or you can split the conjunctiva, the superior bulbar conjunctiva into two parts, either horizontally or vertically you can split them. When you're doing a vertical or a horizontal uh, uh, splitting, you may not be able to maintain the limbus to limbus orientation. So uh, many of the cases, if you, you may have to do a uh, vertically split conjunctival autograft without orientation, limbus to limbus orientation. And uh, conjunctival tissue graft from the terrigium, which I've already described, and amniotic membrane transplantation can be done in these cases because you have a large area of the base clear to cover. So many a time, if the superior bulbar conjunctiva, you are not able to take a large graft. In such cases, if uh, there is amniotic membrane available, you can use that uh, to cover the base clear area because amniotic membrane transplantation works very well in primary terrigium. It is uh, the results are comparable to uh, conjunctival auto transplantation. So here is an uh, animation showing vertically split conjunctival autografting. Uh, if you are going to slide the graft and if you are going to place the graft uh, with the limbus to limbus orientation, then you are not able to cover the entire vascular defect. As Dr. Muscati has mentioned, if you leave the area bare without covering it, it can act as a potential source for conjunctival irritation. You can end up having a, a recurrence. So uh, in these cases, what we can do is you can split the conjunctival uh, graph, superior bulbar conjunctival graph. You split it into two parts and uh, slide it down without uh, orienting the graph uh, with the limbus to limbus orientation. You can just slide the graph down and uh, cover the entire vascular defect. So what you need is a, a cover for the epithelial defect, that is a bare scleral defect. So thus it reduces the uh, recurrence. And uh, this is the uh, video uh, demonstrating this particular procedure of vertically split conjunctival autograph. And you cut the uh, conjunctiva, you split the conjunctiva into two parts before making it a free graft and uh, without changing the orientation, if you see here, this is the limbal end of the graft. This limbal end of the graft has gone uh, to the inferior part of the defect. And uh, you can cover it easily. In the both areas, you can cover easily. And uh, this particular technique, uh, we have done it in uh, uh, close to 100 cases. And uh, it's a double head pterygium excision with a modified vertically split conjunctival autograph. Uh, six year long follow up, which was uh, published in uh, IJO 2017. And uh, the results were excellent. Uh, we had uh, less than 4% uh, uh, recurrence in this series. And subsequently, uh, we uh, published a large series in uh, OJO in the year 2020. And uh, the recurrence rate uh, was less than uh, 3%, it's 2.7% uh, in this large series. And we compared even uh, a vertical split conjunctival autograft with and without limbal orientation in cases of double heterogeneum. Again, there is no significant difference in the outcome and uh, uh, the recurrence rate was almost comparable in both the series. Coming to the second donor graft, we all know like uh, if uh, the, this is a particular case, the particular patient had uh, temporal pterygium which is excised and we have used up the uh, superior bulbar area for grafting and there is a graft which has actually taken up very well and he comes back uh, to us after five years with the nasal pterygium which is uh, large enough uh, uh, to be operated. So you can either take a graft from the uh, inferior bulbar conjunctiva or you can even take a graft from the superior bulbar conjunctiva if your uh, dissection is uh, perfect in the first uh, or a primary procedure. So uh, what you have to do is just uh, inject uh, uh, either lignocaine or even saline and uh, raise a blip and separate the uh, superior bulbar graft. 
can see there are fibrosis. So if your dissection is perfect, uh, you may not have a lot of fibrosis. And uh, again, this particular uh, conjunctiva is a little thicker as compared to the virgin conjunctiva, but it serves the purpose. The results are good. And this again, uh, we published it in uh, IJO, which has come out recently in 2020. Efficacy of a second donor conjunctival graft from the same site for uh, pterygium. And uh, our study signifies the imp uh, importance of clear, careful dissection of the donor conjunctiva during the pterygium surgery, as the patient may present with the second pterygium over the other side of the bulbar conjunctiva or with the recurrence. And in, in any of these cases, a second donor uh, conjunctival graft can be uh, retrieved from the same site. And uh, we could not find any difference in the efficacy between the first and second donor uh, uh, conjunctival graft. The outcome was good. It was uh, the recurrence rate was 4.43%. Uh, we did it in uh, 23 cases and only one patient had a recurrence. We had a follow up of around three years. Coming to recurrent pterygia, uh, we all know recurrent pterygia is nothing but the regrowth of fibrovascular pterygia like tissue crossing the limbus onto the cornea or fibrovascular recurrence attaining the same degree of corneal encroachment as the original lesion or regrowth exceeding one millimeter onto the cornea. If you see on the left hand side, this is a, a typical corneal recurrence. It has reached the pupillary area. It needs surgical procedure. It has to be excised. But on the right hand side, if you see, there is recurrence of the pterygium but it has not reached the limbus. There is a, a barrier which is preventing it from reaching the limbus. This is called conjunctival recurrence. This need not be operated upon. We can observe this particular patient, but on the left-hand side, uh, this has to be operated. So what are the options which are available for us for recurrent pterygium? It's mitomycin C uh, with or without uh, conjunctival autografty. And uh, you have conjunctival autografty, conjunctival limbal autografty, Conjunctal autografting with slit, amniotic membrane transplantation with slit. So, mitomycin C in the concentration of 0 0.02 to 0.04% has been tried in many cases, and uh, various authors have their own protocols, and uh, various surgeons have proposed their own uh, protocols. It can be used intraoperatively or it can be used pro postoperatively, or even uh, before the surgery, we can inject mitomycin C into the uh, neck of the pterygium and we can reduce the size of the pterygium, and then over a period of time, uh, uh, the vascularity reduces, we can go ahead and do the uh, surgery. So uh, there are various regimens uh, which have been uh, followed, but uh, uh, the intraoperative regimen has uh, been popular. And uh, there is one uh, uh, very good study which was uh, published way back in 98 uh, uh, in ophthalmology, which compared 0.02% of mitomycin C with 0.04% of mitomycin C. And if you see the recurrence rate, it is comparable. So like uh, it is less than uh, 7%, it's close to 7% uh, in both the series. And uh, we can use a lower concentration because a higher concentration will have surgical complications like uh, epithelial defect or uh, persistent uh, epithelial erosions, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, these complications can be avoided if you're getting the same uh, result with the lower concentration. There's one more study which compared limbal conjunctival autotransplantation with mitomycin C. And again, the results are comparable. Both had uh, uh, close to 13, 14% recurrence, but uh, both are comparable. But mitomycin C series had a uh, lot of other complications like SPKs and epithelial defects, et cetera, et cetera. So limbal conjunctival autotransplantation, I prefer limbal conjunctival autotransplantation over mitomycin C. And there are a few more publications which compared intraoperative mitomycin C versus postoperative mitomycin C. But there was no significant difference as far as the recurrent rate was concerned. And uh, this is one of the complications we have to observe in these patients who are on postoperative mitomycin C. They have to be called for regular follow-ups because this is a dreaded complication 
this is one of the blinding complication of mitomycin C. Though it is not very common, it is rare, but uh, you cannot have a, a blinding complication for a non-blinding condition like uh, terrigium. So you have to be prepared to handle this uh, uh, rare complication, but it is a significant complication. So my technique is uh, recurrent terrigium extended resection with limbal conjunctival uh, autografting, where uh, I do a conjunctival resection of, and fibrovascular resection, and one millimeter of the normal conjunctival tissue all around uh, about 0.5 millimeter of uh, the tenons is also resected under uh, uh, underneath all around. Uh, behind and beyond the excised conjunctival margin. And then I take a graft, a conjunctival limbal graft. This I have included a thin block of tissue <coughs> from the limbus. And this is a conjunctival limbal autograft. This is a recurrent terrigium uh, surgery with extended resection uh, with a limbal conjunctival autograft. This gives excellent results. And uh, we published this data. We have done it in close to 256 patients. And uh, the results are excellent. Uh, this particular series had only 2.7% recurrence. It was published in International Journal of Ophthalmology in uh, 2020. So what are the causes of recurrence after conjunctival autografting? It is insufficient graft size. If you see the size of the graft, there is a bare area. It is a small graft. And uh, this is a potential area for conjunctivalization. You can see a knuckle of tissue which can extend or which can grow over the conjunctiva here, over the cornea and uh, thick graft. If you have included tenons in the graft, it can lead to uh, retraction of the graft. If you see here, there is a retracted graft. Luckily, the limbal end of the graft is intact so that uh, there may not be recurrence. But if you have lost this graft because of retraction, you would have ended up with the re uh, recurrence. Uh, cosmetically, also, it is not uh, uh, so comfortable for the patient as well as for the surgeon also. And uh, it can uh, lead to a bump, that is a surface irregularity, and it can lead to tear film instability, and the patient can complain of uh, irritation or watering, etc. And the graft inversion, this is what we have been discussing, uh, Dr. Muscati, Dr. Paras, and all of us, Dr. You know, uh, so this is an upside down graph. That is very important to identify the uh, orientation of the graph, uh, the epithelial side and the stromal side. If your epithelial side is down and your stromal side is up, you end up having a graft necrosis like this. This can happen within two days of the surgery. And within a month or so, you can end up uh, having a recurrence. This has to be removed. This has to be removed. This has to be excised. And uh, you have to either take a graft from the inferior bulbar conjunctiva or you can take a amniotic membrane graft and uh, place it on this bare scleral area because it incites a severe inflammatory reaction. Usually it takes uh, four to five months for the recurrence to occur. But in these cases uh, where there is a necrosis or sloughing of the graft, uh, it causes a lot of inflammation and within uh, one to two months itself, you can see a conjunctivalization of the cornea And inadequate peripheral excision. This is what I was alluding to. Uh, there is a nice graft here, but if you see the periphery of the graft, it is not a covered area, it is an uncovered area and there is a knuckle of tissue which has grown onto the uh, cornea. So this is this suggests it is a uh, inadequate peri peripheral excision has happened uh, uh, in the inferior half, inferior part of the uh, base sclera. So uh, the next uh, important cause for recurrence of uh, conjunctival uh, occurrence of pterygium is uh, persistent inflammation, which can lead to conjunctivalization of cornea. Even if you have a nice graft here, so fibrovascular tissue proliferation can occur, which can cross over the graft and it can develop a, a recurrence. So what you have to do is you have to take an adequate uh, uh, sized graft. It should be a large, generous graft, as uh, uh, Dr. Muscati was uh, mentioning. You should have a large, generous graft. It should be around 0.5 millimeters uh, more than the defect. And adequate removal of fibrovascular tissue is very important. 
obtaining a thin tenens free graft uh, it helps in the in prevention of retraction and the subsequent loss of graft adequate self stabilization of the graft and the proper orientation of the graft it's very important and uh, another two quick uh, videos this is autologous blood we all do uh, surgery uh, uh, graft fixation uh, either using the autologous blood this is actually a clotted blood and uh, it should not happen that you place the graft on the clotted blood it will not stay it should be a thin it is a ooze on which you have to place the graft in a clotted blood on a clotted bed the graft will not stay you have to understand that it will cause the graft loss so you know if you allow the ooze to happen if there is no ooze you can just scratch the sclera and it causes fresh ooze to happen and then you place the graft and it should be an adequate sized graft it should not be an over sized graft here it should be adequately covering the vascular defect and finally you check for the uh, stability of the graft in these cases you have to check for the stability you move the lid over the graft so that you will know whether it is stable or uh, it is not stable and uh, we had a, a large series of uh, Uh, outcomes of pterygium surgery using glue versus autologous blood and uh, versus sutures for uh, graft fixation it is close to 200 cases in each group and uh, we found uh, the glue and uh, sutures the outcome is almost uh, similar and the recurrence rate was less than 3% in these two uh, groups but in autologous blood uh, the graft fixation is not uh, uh, as tight as it is for glue or for sutures and the recurrence rate was around 5.5% so like one has to wait for a couple of minutes before the closing and overnight patching is required in the case of uh, autologous blood fixation another technique is graft edge cauterization so when you are using glue or uh, autologous blood uh, for grafting uh, what you can do is uh, just place the graft the adequate sized graft and uh, then you cauterize the edge of the graft using your bi bipolar cautery it it remains stable so it is an additional uh, uh, fixation uh, for the graft so this uh, definitely uh, improves the outcome and uh, chances of graft loss is uh, minimized those who are doing the autologous blood uh, for fixation uh, they can do this particular procedure this is uh, by polar cautery is available to everybody who is uh, using a, a feco machine so and uh, then check for the stability of the graft so uh, to conclude uh, we have to use a right surgical technique my preferred choice is conjunctival autografting uh, the conventional conjunctival autografting for uh, primary pterygium if uh, the conjunctival autografting is not possible then you can go ahead with amniotic membrane transplantation or uh, conjunctival tissue graft from the pterygium itself and uh, for recurrent pterygium uh, my preferred technique is uh, limbal conjunctival autografting and right method of graft fixation it may be either glue or suture or uh, autologous blood and uh, if you follow all these uh, uh, <coughs> uh, techniques properly or the, if you choose the surgical procedure properly the outcome will be good so you can achieve optimal outcome uh, uh, but finally it is uh, the surgeon's choice and uh, expertise uh, that should dictate the procedure of choice in these cases thank you very much excellent presentation dr sish thank you thank you you made some points very very clear so now we will have some uh, discussion on various topics and questions dr kurishar please uh, take the lead yeah so uh, uh, shrish uh, uh, you know mm -hmm. when you are discussing recurrent pterygium all of us have sometimes come across three times four times five times recurrent uh, uh, pterygium uh, how do you look after the medial rectus muscle in these cases yeah this actually is uh, very difficult in cases of uh, third recurrence or fourth recurrence there will be fibrosis of the uh, medial rectus it's very difficult to separate it uh, so you have to leave that particular area and excise the uh, tissue all around 
so you should not disturb it otherwise you may end up uh, cutting the medial rectus uh, which is very close to the limbus maybe around 5 5.5 mm uh, uh, from the limbus so it's very difficult to identify the plane there so you can leave that particular area and then you can exercise the remaining part of the uh, fibrovascular tissue and uh, uh, in such cases if there is uh, no superior bulbar conjunctiva available because of the previous surgery if the other eye has a virgin conjunctiva you can take graft from the other eye and uh, you can do a slack in these cases you can take a small piece of uh, limbal tissue from the other eye and uh, you can place it uh, on this particular area and uh, cover it either you can uh, use amniotic membrane overlay along with conjunctival autografting and slack Paras, do you want to comment on this? Yeah. yeah. Three, four times uh, uh, recurrent, yeah. Agree, those, agree with Dr. Shrish that those cases are very challenging to tackle. But the key is uh, we have to remove as much fibrosis, fibrotic tissue as possible. That is one. And second thing is to prevent the possibility of recurrence. Maybe you could combine it with the conjunctivo limbal autograft or a mini slit, which again, Dr. Shrish added to that. So, but at times, I mean, I do remember one incidence where I had to call one of my pediatric, uh, you know, I mean, ophthalmology colleague to make sure that, you know, I mean, the uh, medial rectus is isolated and we could, you know, I mean, handle that. So you sometimes you can take the help of your colleague also to make sure that your uh, surgical planes are perfect and you don't lose the medial rectus. Yeah, so just one more thing that I do is that if I'm doing a recurrent erigium, first of all, I will perhaps, because I'm in private practice, I can afford to keep it as the only surgery of that day because I don't know how much time I'm going to take. So good uh, anesthesia, I give a peribulbar block. The other thing is that I will take a muscle hook since I do squint surgeries myself. I will take a muscle hook and I will clean the medial rectus. I will find the medial rectus and, and clean it so that it is looks uh, virgin, almost as if I'm going to do a squint surgery there. And sometimes I find it necessary, I will put an amniotic membrane sleeve over the medial rectus yes. and then go ahead with the conjunctival uh, uh, autograph. So just some uh, thoughts on this. Um, the Paris, when in, in your talk, when you, uh, I, I, in some of the nuances, some of the tips that you gave, uh, you said that you prefer to first make a cut at the limbus a little inside the uh, uh, limbus. Some people prefer to go a little the furthest away, about three, four millimeters from the limbus and start from there and go forward. Some people prefer to start from the head of the pterygium. And uh, uh, what kind of forceps were you using to peel the pterygium? Uh, Dr. Maskati, uh, I mean, I prefer to, like, like a rec recurrent pterygium, I prefer to save on the conjunctiva so that my graft size, which is, I mean, the graft which is required, the conjunctival autograft, that size would be optimal, like, you know, I mean, five by eight or four by six or something like that, so that I don't lose that much conjunctiva. So I prefer to, I use limbus as a reference plane, and I prefer to cut little inside. As Dr. Shrish was uh, talking about using the same conjunctival tissue from pterygium itself to, you know, I mean, use as a conjunctival autograft. So here I'm trying to save the tissue from beginning itself so that we don't lose much tissue there. That is one thing. And second part, what did you ask? What forceps, forceps do you use? Yeah, I, I do use, you know, I mean, Mac, uh, like Hoskins forceps to hold the head of the pterygium. But I assist it with the help of, as you saw that in a very large pterygium. I used, yeah, I used the 15 number blade to remove that uh, epithelium so that you can, you know, I mean, peel it off very well and uh, use a counter pressure with a Q-tip on the other side. Uh, what about an artery forceps or a mosquito? One could one could use it, but I uh, it would the kind of you know yeah one could use it, but I haven't really you know I mean used it. I agree. I'm, I'm happy that you have not. I'm, I'm pointing it out because I've seen youngsters boasting about a three minute pterygium surgery where they simply yank it off with an with a mosquito forceps. I mean you can use a sledgehammer to hit a fly, but uh, we, we we need to be a little more delicate with our um, tissue. That's the uh, reason why I'm sorry, but I, I brought up this um, uh, use of the mosquito. It's quite common among residents, 
because because their their senior has taught them this you know that just teri jam you have to finish in 5 minutes we got other case cases uh, uh, pending hurry up next time i won't give you a teri jam to do you know so the poor fellow just yanks it off with a, a, a mosquito because that's the fastest way you can yank it off then cleans a little bit with the uh, knife and and leaves the bare sclera so that's why i just mentioned this as something please avoid please use delicate um, instruments for terigem they are not going to get spoiled don't preserve your instruments only for your cataract surgery uh, shrish uh, when you were talking about um, the the various uh, methods that you use one of the things as i as i was saying in the beginning is to turn the, the head of the terigem round to face have you tried something like that Um, no sir, I have not. I have always taken a free graft. I have not done that. Now, of course, it's a good idea. Actually, you are not uh, cutting the uh, tissue there. You are just uh, 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 excising the head of the terigem and then uh, just turning it down. And uh, uh, but cosmetically, it may not be acceptable to many of the patients. Uh, so this uh, conjunctival autograft gives uh, excellent uh, cosmetics. <laughs> So it's only a, a surgery of last. I've used it in, I, I, I think, two or three cases. I tried it, but it gives you, gives you a yellowish, brownish tinge at the end, which is which is cosmetically not so not appealing. Yes, agree. Uh, Paras, you've heard of this perfect technique, uh, which I think from Australia or from where it had uh, come with P E R F E C T standing for some things which I don't know. How different is it from our regular uh, C A G? a uh, perfect technique was described by professor hurst from uh, australia yeah and somehow he uh, believes in you know i mean removing all the terigem all the way up to carankal and uh, kind of you know i mean put in a encircling suture to make sure that there is no recurrence of that particular terigem but i have not seen the surgery But Shrish, I, I, I with your with your with your huge numbers, have you tried perfect technique versus a, a something else? I am not very really convinced with that particular technique. Perfect, it stands for uh, regime extended resection with the uh, extended uh, conjunctival autografting uh, uh, transplantation. Okay. Uh, so uh, this particular technique, uh, as uh, Paras mentioned, uh, he dissects uh, from superior rectus to inferior rectus. Sacrificing normal conjunctiva also, normal tenons also, is almost half of the vulvar conjunctiva is gone. Carankal uh, sometimes. Yeah, and uh, medially up to carankal, uh, he exercises everything, and uh, it takes two and a half hours for him to finish one surgery. I don't think it is uh, practical in our scenario, and uh, I don't uh, uh, like. Uh, I'm not a proponent of this particular technique. so we can go ahead and do extended resection and uh, limbal conjunctival autograft that gives excellent results yes can i make a point sir yes for us uh, actually speaking we don't really need to remove so much of tenons from a terigem belly uh, as you saw in my surgeries like we need to remove only 2 to 3 mm of uh, tenons subconjunctival tissue from the terigem belly to make sure that there is no cosmetically unacceptable results and if the conjunctiva free conjunctiva is available and uh, that opposes very well to the conjunctival autograft you don't have recurrences and cosmetically it looks much better you don't need to really go beyond so much to kind of you know remove every uh, large amount of tenons capsule and go on uh, to that extent so that you require a very very large graft uh, shrish uh, you at the i foundation you have lots of um, uh, gadgets and machines i get patients sometimes asking me very disappointment lot of disappointment in the face because aap laser se karne wale nahi hai kya you are not going to use the laser because laser is used for everything in ophthalmology i think even collision so uh, you people have various lasers have you have you ever experimented with that machine so that i can tell patients okay. if you want laser go to shrish yeah Yes, sir. This is actually we also encounter this problem because uh, we do so many laser procedures, varieties of laser procedures. But uh, uh, for terigem, no laser surgery. <laughs> we have to tell them that uh, we can do it under topical anesthesia. I usually, almost all the cases, even if it is a recurrent terigem, I do it under topical anesthesia. Okay. And uh, I give subconjunctival infiltration. That is uh, to the terigem tissue itself. I give uh, lignocaine. Uh, 
after anesthetizing the area with the cotton bud and uh, that works very well and patients are also happy and they also cooperate during the surgery we uh, they can move their eye towards the opposite side for a proper dissection and all and never uh, can be i ask them to go ahead with the glue i don't do okay. so in this case so this is what uh, the best we can do for these patients with the high expectations Yes, we know. I think eczema can be used for eczema can be used for smoothing the surface, but I think it will be an overkill. It will be very expensive. It will perfectly smooth the surface. <laughs> okay. I think that that sums up our uh, discussion. We know. Yeah. So, any role of anti VEGF injection or something on the pterygia does it help? So, people have reported that they are using it. What's I it? have not tried. Anti, anti VGF injection of what sir? Avastin. Avastin. No, it's all like yeah. uh, it reduces the vascularity. But uh, if you're operating uh, on the patient uh, in a highly vascular uh, uh, terrigium, that is like a recurrent terrigium, you can give Avastin, wait for two to three days, and uh, then go ahead with the surgery. That's what even vitreoretinal surgeons uh, do. They give Avastin and then go ahead with the vitreous, uh, vitrectomy surgery. Similarly, we can give injection and uh, do the surgery after two to three days. But uh, uh, even uh, by giving the steroids, uh, you can reduce the vascularity and then go ahead with surgery. So, additional, additional uh, uh, charge fee we are going to collect for this. So, it may not be a, a cost is effective for many patients. So, right, sir, we had a very, very healthy discussion. Uh, I think uh, it's going the time for dinner for audience also. And thank you so much. We enjoyed the talk so much and we learned so much. I mean, as a general optimist, I can tell you, I learned so many things. I, I mean, we were just taking to uh, tell too trivial and just keeping it low. When the cataract surgery over, we'll do it in five minutes to two minutes. But I think it's required a proper planning, it requires a proper uh, surgery, and we have to look out for the cosmos and recurrence also. So we have to have a, like any surgery, we have to plan everything and go in details for this thing. So with this, we end this session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maskati sir. Thank you, Paras. Thank you, Sulish, for a wonderful yeah. talk sent to the session. I think next time we can add, you know, I mean, terigium to a refractive surgery armamentarium. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, <coughs> at, at least for premium cataract surgery, I think Terigium makes a lot of lot of difference. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Can we, can good night, go all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Navneet, you can make a soft line. Uh, yes, sir. Make a soft line.